finished up buy-ins last week, uh, apparently, um, and so uh, we talked about, as he left, remember, they thought they had it all buttoned up. They thought, absolutely, if you can get an opportunity to have religion be, uh, uh, be a money maker, that is a great opportunity, right? That was a big thing when I was growing up in the 80s was the growth of the televangelist um, and uh, the Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and that whole scenario and the amount of money. And then there was Fletch 3. Uh, which I, or Fletch two, yeah, Fletch two, um, where he comes in there and he goes down in the south and becomes one. And it was it's actually one of my favorite movies. Actually, I think it's really funny. But um, sorry, we don't have no notes this week. Sorry, we'll get it figured out. They're online. Yeah. Under what online where are we at? If you go to the website, you would go enter Sunday's Grow, grow. Uh, Sunday School Notes. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah. Ah, this thing stinks. All right. I'm going to get settled. All right. So um, as they worked through, uh, with buy-ins, um, remember they thought I had a button down. You can, get, you can get a bigger church. You can get a, a rich wife, whatever it is, if you just act more religious. And that makes it sense, right? Because then you're growing in your spirituality at the same time that you're getting material blessing. You have it all. You literally have everything that you possibly want, right? And then all of a sudden, um, they come to Christian, and Christian says, do you remember Hammer and Shechem? Do you remember Simon the Witch? Do you remember Judas? All those guys also thought religion was a great way to get rich. All those guys followed their God mainly just for the blessing that that God can give them. And that is 90% of religion in the world, right? Is just trying to appease the God so you get what you want. And that's exactly what he accused them of. And then at the end, they all stand silent and just kind of let Christian and hopeful move along. Okay, so that's where we're at this morning then. Um, <clears throat> then Christian hopeful out went them again and went till they came to it at a delicate plain called Ease and where they went with much content. But that plain was but narrow, so they were quickly got over it. Now, ease is, is, is basically, it's, it's not really, it's gently sloping, very easy to follow. There's no uh, hills, there's no rocks, there's no obstacles. They're just kind of going over it. So it's, it's nice and simple, right? Um, but the plain was very narrow. Meaning what? nice and short, right? So they had this time of rest, they had time of ra relaxing, a time where it wasn't very complicated to walk. There weren't a lot of persecution, there wasn't a lot of trials, they were just able to go and enjoy their walk with the Lord, right? Without being accosted by something that's going to tempt them otherwise. Does that make sense? But, as you probably have gathered if you've been a Christian for any length of time, <clears throat> those times don't last very long. <clears throat> And usually the times in between them are much longer than the times that you're in them, right? So this is a very narrow plane. They get over it quickly. Now, here's the challenge. When you go through the, a plane of ease, what's the temptation? Stay there. To stay there. Not wanting it to end, right? So now we've already started our temptation. The, the rest itself can be the temptation, Right? And that's going to be our theme for the next couple of weeks because he's going to get it here and then we're going to get to the river of God. And that's going to be even more challenging because then they get off and immediately the road gets really hard and rocky. So same thing here. They get through ease. They quickly get over it and now they have this temptation. Are they going to forget who brought them there? Who They're going to, for, they're going to forget the journey because they enjoy this nice short path. So let's see what happens here. Now at the further side of that plain was a little hill called Lucre. And in that hill, a silver mine, which some of them that had formerly gone that way because of the rarity of it, had turned aside to see. Now we're going to stop there for a second. Um, lucre. That's not a term we use very much anymore. What does it mean? It's Latin for money, but keep going with it. The King James is where it came from. The King James Version um, uses it in a specific context. Not necessarily. It's still money. But in the King James, it, the, the term itself is just simply money. But in the King James, it's almost always used in terms of money that was that had been gotten through ill-gotten means. Okay, so this is money that you um, you are cheating, lying, stealing, whatever it is. You're trying to get it through some dishonest means. Okay, so this is a hill called Lucre, and in that hill is a silver mine, which some of them had formerly gone 
because of the rarity of it, had turned aside to see. Now, what is he trying to communicate with the rarity of it? Why would he say that? Why is it rare? Why mention that detail? Right, it's kind of out of place, but what would that represent then? It's a unique opportunity. A unique opportunity and a very uncommon opportunity, right? Now, you, now imagine this is, this is what we're going through. We go through ease. I really like ease. I don't really want to give up on my ease. I'm kind of enjoying the fact that it was pretty simple. And now we get to the point where we can, um, we, we have this hill where there's a silver mine. If I go put myself to the silver mine, what will I get? Silver mine. Silver. Yeah. It wasn't that complicated, right? So if I go to the silver mine, if you guys want to sit there, I'm going to spit on you. If you want to, you can move back there if you want to. All right? If I go to the silver mine, I could possibly, I can mine this a little bit, right? So it's not necessarily work-free, but it is productive work. I'm assuming that there's silver in the mine. If I go to the mine, I can go, I can go mine, I can make some money quickly, and I don't get this opportunity very often. And that right there is your trick. Because if it's too good to be true, then it probably is, right? Because what's the key? Some that have formerly gone that way because of the rarity of it had turned aside to see. So what does this great opportunity require you to do? Leave the path. Leave the path, right? Basic rule number one of the path, Stay on it. Basic second rule, keep going. It's not complicated. It's profound, but it's not complicated, right? So these ones, because of the rarity of this mind, because it was so uh, such an opportunity, all they had to do was just get off the path, just aside to see it, because it's just so rare. How could you? How could you not get off? the path. Do you see the temptation in this? It's not far off the path. It's just off the path. You only have to turn aside a little bit. You don't see it very often. It's a great chance to be able to get what you're looking for and be able to enjoy the plane of ease, maybe make a little bit longer, a little bit longer for myself. If I can just get that easy money, if I just have that opportunity to get my business venture going, if I can just I mean, I'll skip a few Sundays, but I'll go ahead and do this, right? And I'll be able to set up my family. I'll be able to make enough money for my kids' college. I'll be able to X, Y, and Z. Do you see how that works? Those would be the modern terms. It's not a silver mine. It's not lucre. For us, it would just be just compromising a couple things. Just a little bit to be able to get this great opportunity that will set up my family for a long time. That's how we'd frame it. Jason, was, was John Bunyan a... Um Man, his, yeah. Most of his life. Yeah, Tinkerer didn't make much. Yeah. It was good work, but it wasn't going to make you rich. Steady, but right. Was, was he at all, um, the term I've heard used in the last 20 years or so is there's a philosophy out there of being broke for Jesus. <laughs> you, 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 you so turn away from the silver that you think. There's benefit to being poor. Yeah. Sure. I mean, that was from the very first, right? That was all the, the monks that would go off into the desert, the hermits, and they thought that if they gave up everything, they'd be more holy. Exactly. Does Bunyan... No. Like no, I mean, he had, he had people that give wealth. He, I mean, he had people that provided for his family when he was in jail, right? So he understood the need for wealth. Um, if you look at Luther, uh, Luther was um, rescued, essentially, by a very rich man who kept him safe. Right, so I don't. None of these guys really have an issue with wealth. I don't think a lot of the Puritans that we follow. For, he's not grinding a particular axe. No, okay. not at all. His his the, the the key here is that the hill has a mine. The mine can be worked, yes. and is, but it's just off the path. We're we're continuing on that same theme of buy-ins, right? And we're starting to transition into this idea of ease, which we'll get into more next week when we get to the river of God and bypath meadow but the idea that he went across ease and then now he immediately met with a temptation for easy money which essentially just extends the the um the plane of ease just a little bit longer right i can i can set up my family i can get some more money that's his idea we're still on that covetousness theme 
okay? If I can just get a little bit more. Um, I ate at Jimmy John's. They actually have a sign that says the difference between um, enough and a little more is very, very, is a, a line that will never be crossed, right? Because you're always just this much more from having enough, if that's your mindset. And so here's a challenge. Will they, will they leave? Will they go because of the rarity of it? Because without, with a small little compromise, they'll be able to make a lot. Will they do it? I think your keyword is compromise. Yep. For, I mean, for us. Mm -hmm. When those things come along. It's just a little bit. Are they provided by God that right. you can do them without compromise and, and thus be able to glorify God right. through them? Or are you going to be required to compromise and right. bring dishonor to God? Right. Do you have to just get off the path? Do you have to get off the path? If God wanted it for you, he would have put it on the path. The fact that he's, it's off the path, and keep that theme in mind because we're going to get to it again. The fact that you have to get off the path by even a little bit means that it's not necessarily what God wanted for you. It's certainly there. It's certainly an option. But is it really God's option? And that's your question. All right. Uh, but going too near the brink of the pit, the ground being deceitful under them, broke and they were slain. Some had also been maimed there and could not to their dying day be their own men again. So here's the other half of the story that never comes up when somebody offers you these opportunities. Right? What could happen if you follow this? Besides your obviously path of getting rich. So you can go to the mine and you can go into... And the mine was not like the mine in, that we see um, in our movies where you go into the side like where um, the DeLorean was kept... Uh, in Back to the Future 3. It's not like that where you go in this way. It was a mine you started at the top and you would kind of dig down into. Okay? So the idea here is you're coming up to the edge of the mine and you're looking in to see where you could go in. But in this mine, because of the easy money, it's, there's two things that could possibly happen. The ground breaks under them and they either fall in and they're dead. Okay? Now the picture of falling into the mine and being slain would be the end of your spiritual walk. You're done. You just, you're never going to come back out. Once you dive into that lifestyle, once you go after that money, that's it. You're just done. You're not going to pursue God anymore. You have just, you've left the faith. You're just done. The harder one here is that they to their dying, that some of them have been maimed and could not to their dying day be their own men again. Now, what do you think that means? What does it mean to be maimed to your dying day? Good. So they haven't lost their salvation, um, but they've lost their communion. So that means that they get back on the path. Okay. But from that point forward, they're walking and they have a limp or they've lost an arm or something else. What would that represent besides loss of communion? Losing your witness. Losing your witness, exactly. How? Let's take Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. If they had repented honestly, and I don't know if they did or not, right? But if they had repented honestly, could they ever come to a church that had any clue who they were and ever be able to share the gospel without a thousand asterisks, without a thousand questions, without a thousand, what about you? How come you didn't do this? What about the way that you acted? Right? Anytime you do this, anytime you compromise your witness, anytime you go after something to a spectacular degree, people will see it. And it brings questions. You cannot minister honestly anymore because there's always questions about your character. Okay? And that's what happens here. They went out of the way. They fell into the mine. They thought they had this opportunity. But what actually happened, even though they made it to the end, they couldn't walk as their own men again. They were always dogged with questions. They, they were always having their reputation follow them wherever they went to. Even though they had repented, the consequences of their actions continued long after the actual action was completed okay so those are your two options either you if you go after this easy money either you die and you give up the faith or your witness is greatly compromised either way take your pick which one would you prefer that's what happens when you leave the path okay all right then i then I, st uh, then I saw my dream that a little off the road over against the silver mine stood demas gentlemanlike, to call the passengers um, to come and see, who said to Christian and his fellow, Ho, turn aside hither, and I will show you a thing. Now, what do you guys know about Demas? Demas is mentioned, 
He's mentioned three times in the, in the New Testament. He loves the things of the world. Good. That's the last time. What about the first two? He was a good servant. He was. He was a good helper. Good helper for who? For Paul. So what does that tell you? That Paul knew him. Paul knew him. And trusted him. And trusted him. Feared he had faith. He traveled with Paul. He walked with Paul. He saw miracles. He was persecuted. He shared the gospel. He helped set up multiple churches. Do you see the picture? He was mentioned in the book of Colossians and Philemon. This guy had seen a lot. He was not new to the faith. He was not a guy just flash in the pan. He was there and then all of a sudden he left. This guy was with Paul for journeys. And then finally in 2 Timothy, so we're closer to the end of Paul's life, this is after years of ministry, that's when he finally says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. So what got to Demas in the end? He walks with Paul for years. He shares the gospel for years. He ministers for years. What got to him? It might have been a combination of things because at the end of Paul's life, Nero was the one that was ruling, so mm. harsher persecution. Mm. Partially. The answer is in what he just said, right? Yeah. He loved the world. What didn't he love? God. There wasn't enough to what the gospel showed to make it worthwhile. And so while persecution may have brought it to a head, the point being that he just plain decided he didn't want it anymore. What got to him was time. I don't like this lifestyle. Where is my award? Where is the crown that I'm supposed to get, Paul? Where is all the promised blessing? Where is all this fulfillment that you said I was going to have? Where is all the riches? Where is all the fame? Paul, we've walked. we set up multiple churches. You said you're a God's servant, specifically set aside for a task. Where is the blessing in that? Shouldn't we be knighted or something? Shouldn't we have a crown? Shouldn't we see some kind of reward? Paul, where is it? Now, did he say that? Of course not. I wouldn't say that to Paul either, right? I mean, this guy is kind of a serious deal. Instead, what does he do? He starts pulling back. All of a sudden, he starts seeing, you know, maybe I don't have time for this, Paul. Maybe next time. I'll just hang back here with the uh, Thessalonians for a little bit. Paul says, hey man, here's the course of the ministry. Here's what God has told us to do. Here's where he's commanded us to go next. Why don't you want to go? Because we set something up here. It's comfortable. I want to stay. Does that make sense? That's what got to Demas in the end. His heart was found out because over time, God was not enough for him. It wasn't about being rich or poor so much as it was it wasn't meeting his expectations. And his expectations are more important than anything else. So he had to have this world. He had to have whatever it is that he wanted, whether it was uh, woman, fame, you know, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life, whatever it is that he wanted. He couldn't find it in the gospel, so he left. But not right away. That's the hard part about Demas. And that's the part that broke Paul's heart. After all that time of ministering with him, he still said, I have to have this world. Okay? So that's Demas. Now Demas, he stands by gentleman-like. There's only one other guy that's mentioned uh, in such a bad context uh, in Scripture. It would be Judas. Judas is Cariot, right? That he's always mentioned as a devil. Demas is right up there with him. But this man stands gentlemanlike, meaning what? Good. He looks very good. Gentleman at this time was more than just what they called you when you walk into the restaurant and that tells you you're getting old. Gentleman is what actually would something like you were upstanding, you were nobility, you had, uh, you kept yourself together. Trustworthy. Hmm? Trustworthy. Uh, potentially, yeah, based okay. on the way you looked. Mm-hmm. When um, Jamestown was founded, they sent a bunch of gentlemen over who were not willing to work I mean, because they thought they were above um, work right. and effort, and that's one of the reasons Jamestown failed. Collapsed. Right, because that was going to be a resort town, right? And here it is, they get <laughs> off, and it's anything but. So, the gentleman like was this kind of idea that you are above and beyond everything, right? You are. Hi, it was um, Downton Abbey. If you've ever seen the show Downton Abbey, I have not seen it. 
<laughs> That's a lie. I had to watch it with my wife. Um, but it was the idea that there was there was different levels of society, right? And there was the servant class. They did the work, and then there was the nobility. Nobility was gentlemanlike. That's the idea. Same kind of concept here. So he stood gentlemanlike to call the passengers, to call the pilgrim, pilgrims, to come and see. Who said to Christian and his fellow, Ho, turn aside hither, and I will show you a thing. So what's compounded now, this mine that's gleaming with little silver specks sparkling in the sun, it's just off the path, you've just gone through ease, and what's more, when you think about Christian, which side, which half of his life are we on at this point? We're on the back half. He's walked faithfully for years. He's been doing this for a while. He's had to fight Apollyon. He's had to go through the valley of the shadow of death. He's had to go through all that stuff of vanity. Then he had to deal with guys like buy-ins. And he's going to deal with even more guys coming up. So what compounds the fact that there's this opportunity over here is time. How much time do I want to put into this faith? How much time do I have to keep suffering? Just even mentally, just the spiritual anguish of screwing up and sin and failing. And then you start watching other people fail and your friends start to pass away. And to people that you have so much hope for never realize that hope. And your kids maybe start to drift or your coworkers that you worked with for years all of a sudden deny the faith or whatever it is. And you start to say all that stuff just starts to beat you down, right? And so more and more, the longer you walk, the more... The temptation to compromise, even a little bit, becomes that much more real. Does that make sense? Especially in America, when you're reaching that second half of life, or the midlife crisis or whatever, all your friends are there, you're getting your retirement set up there, so you can come in. And money seems to be an only pressing issue. What do you know about it, Michael? <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's projecting correctly. The problem will be when you get there, remembering what you just said. Okay? But, nonetheless, Demas stands, and he stands next to it. He's gentlemanlike. So I've got this opportunity, and here's a guy that's bidding me to stop by who looks good. If I can look like him, right, why do we use George Clooney in, in, in commercials? Because if I can look like him, if I use that product, huh? If I can look like him, I'll drink that stinking coffee. Yeah, if that coffee makes me look like him, that's, that's, I'm good. I'm good, right? <laughs> and then if I really want an irritating commercial, I go watch that Pepsi commercial from the Super Bowl where it's just okay. I'm like, oh. <laughs> that's the best you can come up with? All right. So Christian says, what thing so deserving uh, as to turn us out of the way to see it? Demas says, here is a silver mine and some digging in it for treasure. If you will come uh, with a little pain, you may richly provide for yourself. So that's, you know, what we just talked about. Now, Demas isn't necessarily entirely lying, right? I mean, you can go to this mine and if you work a little bit, you'd be able to get something out of it. So he's not lying. It's a real mine. It's not like he's just making this up saying, you know, he's pretending that there's something there that really isn't. There is an opportunity. There is real money to be made here. Okay? Does that make sense? It's not just a mirage. That's what's key. This isn't just pretend, and you've got to convince yourself that it's just pretend. This is real. That's the challenge. This is real, and what you have to do as a Christian is realize what the implications are of the situation, what the dangers are of the situation, what it's going to cost you to follow that situation. There's a very big difference between knowing something's not real and just ignoring it to having something real and glimmering and shiny right in front of you and having to continue to walk. Those are very different scenarios. Okay? This is the much harder one. I was just going to ask you to confirm, is this all about money or is it about covetousness? covetousness, Whatever Whatever your treasure is. Yeah, money is the easiest one. Uh, Hopeful says, then said Hopeful, let us go see. So (laughs) what did Hopeful do? Good. All right, let's go. And he's about to take a step out of the path, right? You can just see him like one foot stretched out, and then Christian just grabs him, right? And yanks him back on the path. And Christian says, not I, said Christian. I have heard of this place before now, and how many have there been slain. And besides that, treasure is a snare to those that seek it, for it hindereth them in their pilgrimage. Now, this has a couple things that are implications. Not I, said Christian. I have heard of this place before now. Meaning what? Council and he's 
children. He's listened. He's listened to the council. He's heard what they had to say, and he actually took it to heart. The, the, the treasure of a parent is for your children to actually listen to what they have to say and actually remember, right? It's like that veiled compliment that your teenager gives you. I know, Dad. Oh, good. Good. So you said it enough times that it's actually in there. Now, of course, the next step is act on it, but that's a different story, right? So here's Christian actually acting on the pearl of wisdom that somebody invested in him. I've heard of this place. It's bad news. Let's avoid it right away, okay? He's read what happens to people like Demas. He's read what happened to people like Simon the witch. He remembers people like buy-ins and what they look like. He's heard those stories that happened in church of that guy that we never saw again because he got rich and that was it. He was done with church. So he's seen all that. He's taken it to heart. He says, I'm not going to go there. I know how many have been slain and treasure is a snare to those that seek it. Then Christian said to Demas, saying, Is not that place dangerous? Hath it not hindered many of their pilgrimage? Now remember, what he's doing is he's standing on the path yelling at Demas from a distance. Right? He's not getting off the path. He's staying right where he is. He's investigating it, but he's, he's not leaving the path. Demas says, Not very dangerous, except to those who are careless, but withal he blushed as he spake. Okay? So is it entirely dangerous for everyone? Well, there's obviously one class of people that it's not dangerous to, right? Who are those? The people that are careful. You're, it's only a danger if you're careless. So if you careful, if you can watch over your heart, if you can walk this razor-thin line that allows you to become rich without losing your faith in the money, if you can walk that line of, of having fame uh, without losing yourself, to the adoration of men. It's all yours. It's all yours. But he blushed. Meaning what? Meaning it's not true. Meaning the number of people that can successfully negotiate that path are none. Very, very slim. You look at those professional athletes, and some of them, uh, you know, some of them are faithful. Tim Tebow's and everything else, and they got to walk such a difficult line to take that kind of fame and pressure and all the things and still remain to be faithful. A lot of them will claim a faith, but when you dig into it, you find there's nothing there. Some of them are real and they have to walk that path and it's very, very challenging. And so there are some, potentially, that can live this life. Very, very few. And he blushed because as he's looking at Christian, what he's not telling them are, there are 0.1% of people that can possibly manage this. I'm not telling you that, but I'm just going to go and blush and let you, you let you find out the hard way. Then said Christian to Hopeful, let us not stir a step, but still keep on our way. Hopeful says, I warrant you, when by ends comes up, if he hath the same invitation as we, he will turn in thither to see. Christian says, no doubt, for his principles lead him that way, and a hundred to one, but he dies there. Now that last statement is um, unvery, unpuritanical, because what did he just do? He just said odds. A gamble. No, he didn't wager anything, obviously, but the fact that he was set odds probably had a few of the Puritans kind of up in arms. What are you doing, John? You can't say that. All right, Demas says this. Then Demas called again, saying, but you will not come over and see. Now, here's the problem. So, they're on the path. They, they do this investigation. He says, nobody but the careless. Christ, hopeful says, wow, I'm glad I didn't go. And Christian says, yeah, we're not going anywhere. Well, that just ended it, right? But Demas says, he calls again. What's true about temptation? It doesn't quit. It doesn't quit. The, the challenge with temptation is it doesn't just do one and done. Most of the time it does once, and then it starts to adjust its techniques. Then it starts to adjust its um, approach. Then it starts to adjust its message, right? Temptation is the ultimate in advertising. If that didn't work, let me try this one. If that didn't work, let me try these colors. I'm going to rebrand. Right? There's, there's rumors that uh, new Coke was just an excuse. They knew nobody was going to like it, and, but it was a great way of getting a ton of uh, attention back to old Coke, which they've been selling for decades. Right? 
the idea just being, I'm going to go change things just enough to get your attention. I'm going to come back. So temptation never yields at the first denial. Temptation is always a war that you have to keep fighting over and over again. So Christian says, Then Christian roundly answered, saying, Demas, thou art an enemy to the right ways of the Lord of this way, and hast been already condemned for thine own turning aside by one of his majesty's judges. Okay, that was Paul. You've already been condemned. We already know that. Um, and why seekest thou to bring us into the, into the like condemnation? Why do you want us to fall into the same pattern as you? Besides, if we will at all turn our side, our Lord the King will certainly hear thereof and will there put us to shame where we would stand with boldness before him. So if we were to do this, we would compromise our witness and our communion with God and he would bring us to shame and we would never, you know, we'd have a hard time looking him in the eye again. Right now we stand in faith, we stand by faith, we stand uh, with his full grace upon us, his favor upon us. We don't want to um, compromise that. So we was, we're going to stay right here, Demas. We are not going to move. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting, okay? Because what did Demas see right after he made his first offer? The hopeful was interested. The hopeful took a couple steps forward, right? <laughs> so, now he finds out that these pilgrims are on the way, and they don't want to compromise their witness. So, what do you do? If you don't read ahead, what would you do? Think nefariously. How do you change your marketing scheme? Use it for the Lord. <laughs> okay. Use it for the Lord. How? How do you get... Because what do they want to do? Demas, we don't trust you. You're already condemned. Why would you bring us into what you're doing? We don't want to do that. What do you do as Demas? He's saying, do you not trust yourself? Like, do you not trust you yourself? Kind of Good. But remember, this is Demas. Keep going with your opportunities. What does Demas know? Who is his teacher? Do you think this guy's got a little bit of theology? Do you think this guy knows a little bit more than most of us? Was this guy there with one of the best earthly teachers to ever walk this planet? He was there as the New Testament was being written. Right? So he's using now, how do I use those subtle things that I know? Demas starts to say, here's what he says, ready? Demas cried again that he also was one of their fraternity. Brothers, I've been waiting for believers to come by. It's been so long. Oh my gosh, I feel like it's been such a dry spell. I've been looking for fellowship. It's so great that you're here. I totally believe that. We, I know that you guys are on your pilgrimage, and I don't want you to stay long. I don't want you to stay long. I want to keep going with you, okay? And if they would tarry a little, he also himself would walk with them. Do you see how the scheme changed now? Now if they go and work, what are they, now think about the benefits. They go off on this thing. Here's a trusted brother. Not just a salesman. This is a trusted brother. He's a Christian. He believes like I do. And if he believes like I do, he must have integrity. If he has integrity, then he's being honest. And if he's being honest, this is a mind with an opportunity. And if I follow that, what am I going to find? Blessing. Because Blessing. God wouldn't put a believer there and tempt me, right? <laughs> so I'm looking at this man, and he's very subtle, and he's very, very good. So now he says, oh, man, oh, yeah, my church is great, too. You guys should come check it out. And so he's inviting them to come in. He's inviting them to trust him because he is a fellow believer. And what's more, if they once they make their money, then what do they do? They become best friends. <laughs> they become friends, but keep going. And then they'll go together. They go together, which means what have I done to my brother? I've won him. I've brought him back to the path. I'm sharing the gospel. The gospel has won a brother. I can, you see the nefariousness of the scheme. This is very, very, very clever, right? This is, I, if I go off on this path, I'm sharing the gospel. I will win this man back for Christ. He will walk with us. The man that left the faith, I will bring him back. He's willing to listen to the gospel if I just go and talk to him. If I just go off the path a little bit. If I just go share a couple beers with him. If I just go and, and, and join this business venture with him. If I just... And you can see also a, a leaving couple that's dating before they're married. 
falling mm. into sexual temptation. And dating evangelism. Yeah, not just evangelism, where they both think that they're believers. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The idea that you can somehow get closer to God if you're together is true, but it's all context. Until you're married, you can't get that close. You're not supposed to be. You will not be as close as a married couple until you're married. There's a lot of growth together. There's a lot of things you can do together. But that excuse of getting together sexually or even just up to the edge, which we talk about that mind breaking down, that's another great place where it does. How close can I get? You uh, Trust me, you're going to fall in if that's one of your questions. Okay? But the, I, I didn't, the I, opportunity here seems so sweet. It seems so powerful. Do you see how he mixed in now? It's not just the easy, oh, easy money. I, I know I should say no to that. Now is the chance to share the gospel with a brother who's drifted from the faith. Now how hard is that to resist? And all it takes is a little bit of compromise. Nothing much, right? Just a little bit of denials. Just a little bit of altering my principles briefly. And then just like he said, we all jump on the path together and we're right back to where we were going. Right? We're not going to be off the path for long. Just long enough. Okay? Of course. It's the way it always works. Uh, then said Christian, uh, what is thy name? Is it not the same uh, by which uh, I have called thee? Yes, my name is Demas. I am the son of Abraham. Ooh, that's a good one. Why well, did he ask him his name again? He's revealing his character. Aren't you, Demas? Don't we know who you are? Don't we know what you're really about? Right? That's what he's trying to say. He's saying, aren't you, Demas? You're tempting me, because he just called him Demas, so he knows that. Don't I know what you're really about, Demas? He goes, my name is Demas. I'm the son of Abraham. Why that? Why pick that? Demas is a Hellenistic Greek name. No, he was a Jew. Hmm? That means he was probably good at money. So as it turns out, um, over time, even though the Jews were in the diaspora, guess what? Jews actually uh, ran most of the banks in medieval Europe. It's one of the reasons why they're so vilified across Europe is they tended to control the money supply. So if you were going broke and somebody came and foreclosed on your house, you usually, not, not always, but you've often found a Jewish person in charge of the bank that was foreclosing on your house. So when it was one of the reasons why Hitler had issues with the Jews it was really easy for him to vilify them because they were usually in positions of that people didn't like. Right? Okay, so that was a side. we got to edit that out because that's probably going to not sound good. But the point here is, he says, I am a son of Abraham. His point being, I am a son of promise. You can trust me. We're all in this together. Uh, I know you. Gehazi was your great-grandfather, and Judas your father. You have trod in their steps, but it, it is but a devilish prank that thou usest. Thy, um, that thou usest. Thy father was hanged for a traitor, and thou deservest no better reward. Assure thyself that when he, we come to the king, we will do him word of this behavior, and thus they went their way. So Gehazi, do you remember who Gehazi is? Elisha. Sam and uh, right. So Elisha was one of the best prophets in Israel's history. Um, Naaman comes up and he says, I have leprosy. I've heard you can heal me. So he has an entourage, camels with gold and everything else. And so this is the one where Elisha says, go down to the river, wash seven times and you'll be healed. And Naaman says, that sounds ridiculous. I can't do that. That just sounds ridiculous. Nobody does that, right? I am, I am holy. Um, I am royal blood. There should be ceremony. There should be pomp. You should come out and put some effort into this. That's who I am. Don't you know what I deserve? And he says, that's it. Take it or leave it, dude. And then he closes the door. Okay, that's my, that's my abridged version. Um, so <laughs> Naaman says, forget this guy. He starts walking away. And that's when um, his servant comes and says, come on, man. What, what harm could it do? Just go down to the Jordan, wash seven times. If you don't, you saw the leprosy. If you do, you're healed. I mean, who cares how simplified it is? Actually, wasn't it the little servant girl that said that? Well, yeah, somebody. And then, yeah, it wasn't Gehazi. That got no, Gehazi, no, no. Yeah. Gehazi is still with, uh, with Elisha. 
it was one of the servants of Naaman that comes and tells him, just give it a shot, dude. I mean, and basically, what you th- I mean, this, the, that part of the story is really interesting because basically he's got this life-ending disease and here's an easy, easy solution that Naaman rejects simply because he doesn't think it's good enough for him. Not because he thinks he's not good enough for it. He thinks that solution is not good enough for him. He deserves something more. It's got to be more complicated than that. There's got to be more to it. I deserve more. My problems are bigger than that. My problems and who I am deserves more attention. Okay? Now take that in a spiritual plane. God, don't you know what I need? Don't you know what I deserve? Don't you know what I've been through? Do you know what I've had to deal with? There's got to be more. So he does it. He ends up trying it anyways. Finds out it actually worked, surprisingly. He walks out of the river healed. And then he's so grateful that he comes back to Elisha and says, take all this money. Elisha says, nope. God didn't tell me to take it. You've been healed. Go your way. I'm done. Now remember, Naaman wasn't a, a Jew. So this is actually a ministry to a Gentile. So I'm not sure exactly why Elisha didn't take the money. Um, it could be because it's coming from a Gentile and he didn't accept it. It could just be that God didn't want to sully. Um, probably, this is more, most likely, uh, in the ancient Near East, you would go and buy favors from priests. Okay, So you would have, you know, in, um, in the Hindu culture, for example, if I moved into a house and I wanted blessing, I would go and pay a priest to come and do a puja in my new place, and that would bring the favor of the gods on my house. So I'm paying for this favor. I'm favor, I'm paying for you to intercede with God on my behalf to get something out of it. So my guess, would, my best guess is Elisha didn't want the money because he didn't want to bring that kind of um, reputation, right? That, that God, that Yahweh could be bought by anyone because that just fits in with every other pagan God that there is. So he refuses the money. Um, and Naaman says, all right, starts walking away. Gehazi waits until Elisha's in the other room, takes off after him and says, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Um, Elisha said he really wants at least some of that money. So just give it to me. I'll make sure it gets to him. So Naaman gives him some money and Gehazi goes back. Okay. Elisha realizes what Gehazi's done, either divinely or he just observes the fact that all of a sudden um, Gehazi has a, um, a very different spending pattern all of a sudden. And so he favors him and says, did we not tell you not to take the money? And Gehazi says, yes. He dies right there on the spot. It was the ultimate end of the story. Okay? Gehazi's killed. All because he couldn't let this blessing go. He had to have the money. It wasn't enough that he served Elisha who served Yahweh. He had to do that and get the money. There was an opportunity that they turned down. How could we turn down easy money? This is free. We didn't have to do anything to deserve it. You're absolutely right, Gehazi. God gets the glory. We're just going to keep walking. But Gehazi has to have the money. The other person referenced, of course, is Judas. Judas was hanged like a traitor. Judas is the one that denied Jesus, uh, gave him over for 30 pieces of silver, denied him with a kiss, and then handed him over to the Jews. And then he was killed later on. Um, and thou deservest no better reward. Assure thyself that when we come to the king, we will do him word of this thy behavior. And thus they went their way. Okay? That's kind of interesting what he just said. When we come to the Lord, we're going to tell him exactly what you did. With the implication being what? And your judgment is going to be that much worse. You're heaping judgment upon yourself. As for us, we're staying in this path. We're not leaving this path. We are staying right where we are. Um, So both uh, Judas and Gehazi were in privileged positions. They loved who they were at. They saw all the great blessings, and yet they had to leave it for money. Um, and they're going to give it up to God. So, uh, by this time, Bayans and his companions were coming again within sight, and they, at the first beck, went over to Demas. And it makes sense, right? Because what was Bayans in true religion for? Money. He was just using it to be able to make his, his, his cash. And so whenever the wind of doctrine changed, he would change with it, right? Because all he wanted was um, to figure out how he can get more. And religion was just one avenue. So here comes this apparently religious fellow. He invites him to come over. Gentleman-like, must be good. Immediately they go over. 
And now whether they fell into the pit by looking over the brink thereof, or whether they went down to dig, or whether they were smothered in the bottom by the damps, uh, that commonly arise. Uh, of these things I am not certain. Okay? So they could have either um, fell in, uh, they went down to dig and never came out. That's the implication, right? You just lose yourself. Or the last one's kind of interesting. Smothered in the bottom by the damps that commonly arise. So the damps was a term that they used. is actually from the German damp. It's um, butchered. D-A-M-P-F. And it was these fumes that would arise in a mine. Um, so if you look at, uh, if you ever go into one, or if you watch it on TV, you know, a lot of times you'll see a little uh, canary. Is it the H2S? Hmm? It, it could be. It could also be uh, a couple other things possible too. But it was they put a bird, right, in this cage, and the bird was basically their uh, gas detector, right. If the if the, somebody looked over and saw the bird dead, we need to leave, right, because um, it, we're bigger, so we can afford a little bit of higher concentration. The canary dies at its lower concentration, so if it's starting to build up and the canary dies, it's time to exit the mine. Right, and those were so there were fumes that would arise, and they weren't always um, smelly, right? That so, for example, especially when it's smaller and it keeps rising, right? So, for example, with natural gas, which most of us use in our houses, they actually add H two S into it because that's that's a rotten egg smell. Um, you wouldn't smell the methane. Methane is odorless. And so they add something to smell so that if there's a leak, you have some kind of detection. Otherwise, it just keeps building up until well, somebody, you know, does the balloon thing on their head and the spark rises and your house blows up. So they have to add something to kind of give you some kind of indicator. Well, that was the same idea with the dams, okay, is that it would slowly build up. Um, one of the uh, concerns when I was, uh, one of the things I could have done is done a lot of well checking which sounded terrible to me at the time, uh, still does. But you would actually go to all these different um, wells and check on how they're doing and adjust performance and things. One of the dangers in those, you know, you see them all the time in Texas, right? These things, you see them a little bit more up north. Um, they would pull up and some of the gases that would come up, uh, hydrogen sulfide and so on, would actually are heavier than air. And so what that means is they come up, they would all just kind of settle on it, especially if it's not windy. They would settle right there around the mine. Um, around the drill, I should say, the pump. Yeah, we, we, um, the summer I rough, not rough neck, roused about it, and we were digging a hole that was only three feet deep, and I already, yeah. we were already getting affected Yeah, because it. it would get pulled up, and this stuff's heavier than air, so it doesn't just blow away or drift away. It starts to build up slowly on concentrations. And so you will go through these um, pumps, and you'll see the truck is just sitting there running, and there's a guy dead, because they walked up to look at it, inhaled it, it just, it, it cuts off your um, body's, your lungs' ability to be able to adjust oxygen, and so you essentially faint, but then you can't move, and so then you just asphyxiate. So yeah, it's it's kind of dangerous. So they have to wear little patches that show, you know, it changes color or something like that when they go in there, so they know if they're walking into a dangerous situation. When they were digging a well, it, it Does that happen? Too. Oh, nice. <laughs> little house on the prairie. Right? So it happens. So this is the damps. And so here, okay, that was interesting. But the point being um, that in the mine, there was these fumes that would arise um, and they would, it would choke you. Right? Here you are in the middle of your work. And it's not that you've given yourself. It's not that something's fallen on you. It was just fumes slowly, gradually, but definitely consume you. Does that make sense? That's what happens when we go and give ourselves. We either get killed immediately, we give it all up because we're going to chase after money, or um, we go into the pit and we just keep digging and digging and digging and digging and digging because we're convinced we're, gonna, we're just one dollar away from having everything we could possibly need. Mm -hmm. Or eventually we just get choked. Our faith dies over time because I compromise a little at a time, a little at a time. I'm out of fellowship. I start going to that Bible study. I start, you know, my family, leave, I leave my family behind. I start getting out of the Word. I stop thinking prayer really can accomplish anything. Little by little, we give ourselves to money. We give ourselves to fame. We give ourselves to whatever our treasure is, and we just lose it. Little by little, the damps, the damp comes up, and it just sucks us away a little at a time. So either way, you're going to die when you go into this mine. Either you're going to lose it all at once, or you're going to lose it a little bit over time. Either way, there is no coming out of this. 
So as we get into these situations, it's not about wealth. There's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with earning a hard living. And if God blesses you, great. Use it for God's glory and use it for your family. Use it for everything that he's given you. At the same time, this is the idea of compromising your principles, compromising your faith, compromising what you know God has said so that you can get money, so that you can get fame or whatever it is, right? This is a, you know, social media is a great place for this. How popular do you want to be on YouTube? It sounds silly to a lot of us as we get a little bit older, but for a younger group, man, that is amazing. This is your chance for fame. How many likes do I have? We see, um, I shouldn't say we, I've read uh, about kids considering suicide because of the number of likes they are or not getting on Instagram. We get articles like this all the time now from the school because the school's having to deal with it. The, the social media, the rise of social media, the, the instantaneous popularity, and just as quickly, the instantaneous loss of popularity. It just compounds things so quickly. So this is what happens. Do you want to lose your faith by chasing after this world? Okay? Covetousness. Covetousness. But this I observed that they were never seen again in the way. By ends. Then saying Christian, by ends and silver, Demas both agree. One calls, the other runs, that he may be a sharer in his lucre. So these do take up this world and no farther and go. So um, they found the mine, maybe. They found the gold, the silver, maybe. They never came back to the past. So they compromised. They sacrificed their own souls for eternity so they could have the silver immediately. Okay? So keep this idea in mind. They had this temptation, um, and then they stayed on the path. They refused the temptation. So now let's kind of bring this up to speed. We've had Vanity Fair that Christians stood fast in. We saw Pollyanna he stood fast in. Here's the silver mine in Demas that he stood fast in. Next week we'll go talk about... Um, uh, oops, we have Lot's wife coming up. Oh, is he, is he? Yes, we'll talk about Lot's wife next week, apparently. Um, and then we will start with the next thing, okay? I will have notes, I promise I'll have notes this week, next week. But um, next week we'll talk about Lot's wife, and then I want to go ahead and get started with uh, the river of God because that's going to set us up, because then we're going to talk about the giant despair. And all these things are going to nice. This is one of the best arcs in the book in terms of just multiple stories all tying in the same theme. So he stood fast. He sees the plane of ease. He refuses to give him the temptation. He stands firm. Now he's going to talk about Lot's wife and how what a, what a, uh, what a witness that is. And then he's going to go through the river of God, which is God's nice, beautiful place of ease and rest and spiritual fulfillment. Do you feel like he's getting built up for something? Yeah, he is. Okay. And we're going to see it. Okay. Questions?